In this module, we're going to begin to discuss a concept referred to as a compensating wage differential. If you think about it for a few moments, workers receive benefits from firms through numerous mechanisms, including the wage and or cash wages and benefits, but also through some level of utility satisfaction or other benefits that are not encompassed within the wage or what we think about as company-sponsored benefits. When we have one job that pays, say, $12 an hour, and another job which is virtually identical, perhaps in the same marketplace, but that only pays $11 an hour, but that has a nicer working environment, maybe even a slightly uh, more, uh, more liberal vacation pay policy, that difference in the wage, that $1 difference in the wage, is considered a compensating wage differential. So the, the firm with the uh, better environment, the more liberal uh, vacation pay, can get away with paying less in the way of cash wages because they give something up for that. They give something more to the worker that causes the worker's total utility between wages, benefits, vacation, etc., to be equal to the wage they would or the utility they would have gotten had they taken a higher wage, the $12 wage, at the other firm, which just didn't have as good a total package for them. So that would be a compensating wage differential. As we look at compensating wage differentials, we're going to look at different wages based upon worker preferences. We're going to look at employee considerations and employer considerations. We'll look at equilibrium in this structure, this CWD, compensating wage differential structure, and we'll look at something referred to as the offer curve. First, let's consider in this segment different wages based upon worker preferences. To begin with, we need to consider a concept that we probably haven't discussed yet, and that concept is that workers are REM. REM means rational, evaluating, manipulative, maximizers. So let's discuss each of these for a moment. First, rational. When we say that workers are rational, it doesn't mean that workers all make the same decisions based on the same bases. It's not that type of rationality. It's not the kind of rationality that we consider when one of us is in disagreement with another and we believe that we're being rational and they're not. It's rational in this sense means that workers, as all consumers in, or all economic agents, actually act pretty much in accordance with what they believe to be true. When someone is acting rationally, we believe that they're acting in their own self-interest. We believe that they're acting in accordance to that which they believe to be true. We believe that their behavior becomes somewhat predictive based upon their normative values. So rational in this case is, is a term that we would apply to all economic agents, including workers in a workplace. Evaluating, or the E in REM, stands for the fact that workers, as do all consumers or economic agents, are constantly evaluating their decisions and choices. You're doing so as you're listening to this segment and looking at this. At some point, you decided, I'm going to go ahead today and work on my labor economics course. And you went into the system and you decided to click on this particular segment. You're listening to this. And you didn't do so because you just naturally or or instinctively uh, went ahead to do this today. You made a decision to do this. You evaluated I have some choices as to what to do with my time at the moment. I have some pressing concerns. I have some utility needs. I have some recreation preferences. I'm going to go ahead and deal with one of my, my pressing concerns, which you believe that then would give you greater overall utility 
than doing something else, and that was to participate in this segment today. So we're evaluating. In fact, we're constantly evaluating. Our brains, our gray matter, are so skilled at evaluation, are so quick at evaluation, that computer programmers, IT developers, and computer hardware manufacturers really simply try to replicate many of the same metrics that we're able to do with our, with our brains. So as economic agents, we're constantly evaluating. Similarly, as economic agents, we and workers generally are manipulative. Now, this again isn't manipulative in the negative sense. This isn't when you feel manipulated by someone emotionally or you choose to manipulate a situation to get simply your own gain regardless of anybody else's. This is manipulative more in the modeling sense. So when we have rationally made decisions and we have then evaluated what we will choose to do in the face of those decisions, we then go about manipulating or maybe a better term is molding our environment, our situation, our uh, our lives to meet our rational expectations and to meet up with the evaluation that we participated in. And we do all of this to a particular end. And that particular end, ha it can be simply uh, summed up in thinking about what consumers want. Consumers and workers all want the same thing, and they want something that's very simple. They simply want more. The original head of the AFL-CIO, which is a labor union in this country, which was initially referred to in the 1800s as the American Federation of Labor, the initial head of that labor union was a gentleman by the name of Sam Gompers. I love that name, Gompers. Mr. Gompers was put before a Senate and House committee in the 1800s as the head of a, this, this newly established labor union, and he was asked, Mr. Gompers, what do you want? And Gompers thought about it for a moment and simply said, Senator, we want more. We want more wages. We want more benefits. We want better working conditions. We want more for our children, more for our families. Well, Gompers was simply reflecting the fact that all economic agents are maximizers. So when I talk about REM, I'm talking about rational, evaluating, manipulative maximizers. And each one of us are REM, all economic agents, including and especially workers, are REM. We also can think about this issue of different wages as a function of worker preferences in respect to workers having complete or possibly incomplete information. If we are going to choose the right wage for our skill set, the right wage for our need, the right wage and benefits combination for our preferences, we need to have complete information. We know completely what kind of a worker we are. We know if we're disciplined. We know if we're slackers. We know if we're texting on the job versus always very focused. We know that part, but we don't necessarily have good and complete information on that which the job offers us in terms of challenges, in terms of resources, in terms of wages, in terms of opportunities, until we've been on the job for a while. And typically, we've accepted a wage level, or at least an initial wage level, before we have been on the job for a while and before we know of complete information. So we have to think about wages and information, both on the side of the worker and on the side of the firm, as we consider this concept of compensating wage differentials. We also need to think about the mobility of workers. We know the workers can go in a particular labor market from one job to another to another, possibly with minimal costs, uh, perhaps a slight job search, perhaps a, a different uh, commute each day, maybe a little bit of time spent interviewing. But that's not always the case. We know that sometimes mobility is a significant factor. If I work for a firm in a small town in the Appalachian Hills, and uh, and it's 50 miles to the next job, and I have uh, uh, transportation that's not very reliable, then maybe my mobility is, is questionable. Maybe my ability to take another job is, is questionable. So we have to think when we're considering this wages and worker preferences, we have to think about mobility, complete information, and the fact that workers are REM. We can also consider then a couple of scenarios in which we are, are looking at labor supply and labor demand. For two different industries, but where we have the same skill requirement. 
In this case, we're going to think about these industries and maybe some compensating wage differential that they, uh, that they would have among them. So if you think about this for a moment, we can consider and we can model industry one and industry two with respect to this compensating wage differential, I've given us two different labor supply and labor demand relations here. And these supply and demand relations, if we calculate them through, are going to give us a couple of different uh, forms. So let's think about what, what they'll offer us. We'll take a look at industry one, number one, and we'll try to identify where labor supply is going to equal labor demand. So negative 38 plus 4W, which is our labor supply relation, Notice that's the same for each of the two industries because each industry is drawing on the exact same labor pool if they're in the same area. And there, but there's a different labor demand that each one of them might have. The first has 95 minus 3W. Well, we can then say that this is 7W is equal to 95 plus 38 or 133. And 133 divided by 7 is going to be our W star for industry 1, or $19 per worker, $19 per hour. Let's think about industry number 2 for a moment and think about its different supply and demand relation. Actually, it's got the exact same supply relation because, once again, we're thinking about this as being within the same labor market. In this case, it's negative 38 plus 4w being equal to 80 minus 4w. And we can then think about that as 8w, excuse me, that was 80, 8w being equal to 38 plus 80, or 118. And 118 divided by 8 is going to give us a w star equal to 14.75. Now we can consider the uh, the equilibrium level of labor in this if we want to, and we can consider the um, uh, the points at which the labor demand and labor supply curve intercept the x and y axes, and we'll do that in a moment. But first, we'll just want to take a look at the difference in these wages. If these two industries have similar skill requirements, which would suggest that they are attracting similar workers with similar skills, but they have, they are paying different wages. What can we presume with respect to them? Well, in this case, the firm that pays the lesser wage, industry number two, we can presume that they're giving something to the worker that's not reflected in the wage itself. Some benefit, some utility, some compensating wage differential that's not reflected in the wage. Perhaps in this case, we have a, uh, a firm that is paying a $14.75 an hour wage, uh, plus some health insurance benefits, plus some vacation benefits. Or maybe we have a firm that is, uh, uh, that is, uh, got a great working environment, or a firm that provides a masseuse on Friday afternoons to relax the workers. Something that gives these workers some utility that they, that they aren't getting otherwise at this, at the other firm. Uh, firm number one, of course, is paying a higher wage. And because they're paying a higher wage, they may feel as though they don't need to provide those other benefits, uh, vacation, health insurance, sick leave, or maybe they don't provide as nice a working environment. The wage difference between these two firms, in this case, $3.25 per hour, excuse me, $4.25 per hour, the wage difference would be a compensating wage differential. We can see then in the basic market models, we can see that if we telegraph this $19 per hour wage over to this other firm, we can see something of the size or value, excuse me, the size or value of this compensating wage differential. We wouldn't necessarily note it in terms of the area of the space I've just identified for you. We would note it in terms of the difference in the wages. So the compensating wage differential is going to equal 19 minus 14.75, or 
or it's going to give us then a $4.25 per hour in this case differential of wages. Now we think about all of this in the context of something referred to as hedonic wage theory. Hedonic wage theory is based on three premises. The first is the jobs involve risks and rewards. So we know that a job may have some positive attributes that are very attractive to workers. Those would be rewards. And a job with great positive attributes perhaps doesn't need to pay as much in the way of a wage to a worker in order to attract that worker because the worker gets utility both from the wage and from these other positive attributes. Maybe there's a great boss. Maybe there is great opportunity for advancement. <coughs> Maybe it's a firm that simply is producing a product that is very attractive to the market, maybe has some very appealing social benefit. Whereas some jobs involve risks. And when a job involves a risk, rather than paying a person less to work at that job because of its risk, we probably have to pay the person more to work at that job. Maybe it requires a similar skill set, but in an environment that is not very safe. Uh, maybe there, maybe it's in an area where there's tremendous amount of crime. Maybe it's in an area where there's chemicals being used. Maybe it's in an area where there, where the equipment and safety conditions are simply out of date. In order to get workers to work at that job, then there might need to be a compensating wage differential, a positive compensating wage differential paid to them to make up for the risk that they are then absorbing. Well, we also have to remember that employees seek utility maximization. Hedonic wage theory is all about utility maximization. Recognize that when we receive a wage as a worker or a wage and some other benefits as a worker, whether they're retirement or health insurance, vacation, etc., they're all seeking to serve a common purpose, and that is the utility of us as workers. So this isn't just about money. This is about money and or other elements that add to our utility satisfaction or maximization. Well, we finally need to think in hedonic wage theory about the fact that not only do uh, workers face uh, risk and reward trade-offs, and jobs face risk and reward trade-offs, employers face risk and reward trade-offs. If I'm an employer and I have an environment that is a little bit risk prone, maybe my safety standards aren't up to date, maybe my, my emissions of different chemicals in the uh, environment are a little bit caustic to my workers and they have to wear air masks and such. I can either pay a higher wage and attract workers to work in that environment, or I could take maybe that same amount of money and I could just remediate the safety concerns of the environment. So I face as a worker uh, a risk and reward trade-off, but I also face the exact same risk and reward trade-off as an employer. 